Hello, I'm Steve, one of the main leaders or key leaders in church life. Really want to welcome you to this podcast. As I talk to you, I stand in my home, social isolating as instructed by Boris. And um, we obviously face a crisis at this moment in time. And so I want to talk today about justice. Is God just? Does the cross show that he is just? I think there are two things in this world that seem to be deeply ingrained in our lives. One is that we need to be loved and to love. Love is something as a child and as people we know is so critical to our lives. And we spoke last time about how God is love, how the cross shows a love that is in God that is far away above anything that we experience or can imagine as human beings. God is love. The second thing that is so prevalent in our hearts and our lives is a sense of justice, a sense of fairness. I well remember as a child playing Monopoly and my counter landing on Mayfair and it didn't belong to me. There were hotels there. I remember storming out of the room in tears. It's not fair. It always seemed to be not fair when I lost, but if I'd won, it might be different. I remember playing football so often at school and lunch times and getting hot and bothered and saying, it's not fair, you cheated. That can't be right. And again, it was so often when I lost. But really sometimes they had cheated. And when I said it's not fair, my dad would often say the world is not fair. And we can see that in poverty, sickness, injustice, wars that embroil people who are just innocent. The world is not fair. Despite this, Christians have pointed to the cross and say that God is just and he will bring the world to rights. So let's read together from Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. We asked last week, why did Jesus die? One reason was that we might be forgiven. But more than that, we might know that forgiveness in our hearts and minds, in a shadow of doubt that God has forgiven us and that he loves us and that we can come into a relationship with him and experience his life. And we have it here in this passage again today. But we'll go on from there to consider our question of justice. But verse 13 says, you were dead in your sins and from the life of God. Dead, it means not that you don't have bios, physical life, but you don't have the Zoe, God life, the spiritual life. You were separated from God. But God made you alive in Christ. He has done something to make us alive. He has done something to enable us to have his abundant life, his Zoe life, the life that not, doesn't just go on forever, but is a quality of life. How did it happen? He forgave us our sins. The barrier that was between us was taken away. We looked at this in a relational way last time, that God in his love had absorbed the hurt of our sin on the cross. And that enabled us then to have his life. And it comes to us personally when we are with Christ, when we are in Christ, if you notice in this passage. And what does that mean? That means that we have faith and trust in what he has done upon the cross. And we ask God into our lives 
and trust him as our saviour and our lord it becomes ours and we begin to have that life of the age to come the eternal life in our hearts but why did jesus die i think there is another reason another reason was in so that he might be just in forgiving us Verse 13 says, he forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. That legal indebtedness was a handwritten document, especially a certificate of indebtedness, a sign confession, which stood as a perpetual witness against us. A perpetual witness against us but he cancelled it which literally means he wiped it clean so there was nothing left on the page but more than that he took away the page he nailed it to the cross he destroyed that document that was against us that was accusing us so that no longer could anyone accuse us of things that we have done wrong Satan, whose name means accuser, can no longer accuse us because God has forgiven us. Now there is a certain element of mystery to the cross and how it actually works. People have tried to explain the cross for then it makes more sense to us. This of course is done often in a way that makes sense to them in their culture and time. So in our time of culture, of love and friendship, I spoke last week of forgiveness, love and reconciliation. But today, in a Christian world, those who believe the Bible, there is a number of differences of understanding how the cross works. N.T. Wright argues in his book, The Day the Reformation Began, that much of our understanding of the cross as Christians today has been affected by the Reformation and our strong sense of a legal system that we have today. So why did Jesus die? Some people, Bible-believing Christians today, and if you hold this view, that's fine, say that the justice of the law might be met. Jesus died so that the justice of the law might be met, so that we could be forgiven. Sin must be punished. A bit like Inspector Chevert in Les Miserables. God is holy. We, he must judge sin. There must be justice. He must go around and make sure that there is justice. So in order for us to be forgiven, Jesus has been punished in our place. A Bible verse might be, the wages of sin is death. And if we're not going to die for our sin, then Jesus has died in our place. But N.T. Wright and people like Gregory Boyd would come with a different view, would talk about what that verse is saying is, is that we reap the consequences of our sin. If we lie, people don't trust us anymore etc. Whatever we sin leads naturally to death, separating us from the reality of God's abundant life. So someone like Henri Norm, who wrote in The Return of the Prodigal Son, he, as in God, has no desire to punish people. They have already been punished excessively by their own inner and outer waywardness. The father simply wants to let them know about the love that they have searched for in all kinds of distorted ways has been is and will always be there for them the father god is always stretching out his arms to those that are already punishing themselves by their sin i think our subject today is how does the cross show god's justice there are different views and this is not necessarily Ebby's view, but this is my view, as I have considered and studied this subject. And it has perplexed me in many ways too. I don't think I have all the answers, but here's some thoughts for you to consider. 
I think there is something in the cross which shows that God is just. However, I think it has much more to do with justice in the sense of God putting the world to rights. For one thing, the early church didn't really have this strong sense of justice view in the cross. Instead, they had a view that it was about conquering over evil, winning the victory. And they, those people in the, in the early church, they understood the language. They understood the context. They understood the culture that these words were written into. And so perhaps of some people have said it wasn't until the 12th century that this other view about substitution and, and the penal sense, a punishment sense, the justice sense came in. And the second reason why I think we can consider this victory sense over evil is the passage that we have today links forgiveness with disarming the powers. Jesus died to win the victory over evil and so begin to put the world right. The verse says, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. He disarmed them and then he made this public spectacle, which people have said is a, is a picture of a procession through a city. Perhaps a Roman general winning a marvellous victory comes back into the city with his army behind him and pulling in and behind them the bedraggled prisoners. A great celebration is had. There is clearly, he has, the general has won a mighty victory. And Paul is thinking of that, that Jesus has won this triumphant victory over evil. But let's consider the first bit that he disarmed the powers and authorities. The first thing is that sin enslaves us. Sin not is not just about breaking the law, you lie, but it's about independence from God, not worshipping him, not being the image bearer that we're meant to be, not filling out our vocation to rule and reign over the world. Instead, as we don't follow God's way, we become enslaved to other gods, the gods of money, sex, power. And behind that, of course, is evil and Satan himself. By rejecting God and his life, we become enslaved into those powers, those evil powers. And as it were, perhaps a picture that might be helpful is that we become um, part of a chain gang, that we have, a, we have a, a chain round our ankle and we're in this group of people that are being led by this powers, the evil master. But when Jesus died upon the cross, he unlocks that chain for us and that we are able to then be set free to live in a different way. I think it's as we realise that we are going the wrong way, we repent, we say, God forgive me, and God says, on the cross I have forgiven you. He unlocks that chain and puts his presence of his Holy Spirit in us so that we begin to follow after the better master, Jesus, the good shepherd of the sheep. And we can dance to a different tune. Satan, as I said, is, the word means accuser. And I can imagine, he often accuses us. You cannot be with God. You are guilty. You are full of shame. Who do you think you are? You've done all these things wrong. You don't have God's life in us. And we tend to hide from God like Adam and Eve did after the fall in the Garden of Eden. But God has forgiven us. He has thrown away that document that says we've done things wrong. He has destroyed it. Or maybe one could imagine Satan accusing God. How can you forgive these people? I thought you were just. And you punish sins. They deserve to be punished. They've done wrong. How can you forgive them for that murder? Or whatever things you or I have done. How? Satan would say that to God. But God can say, 
I have felt that. I really understand it. I have experienced the depth of that sin, but yet I still love them. And I choose whether I forgive people or not. And maybe people might rail at God and say, how can you forgive these people, these perpetrators of sin and perpetrators of sin in my life? How can you forgive the murderer who killed my son? You don't understand what it's like. You don't, you don't know what it feels like. But Jesus was murdered on the cross. The Father saw it. The Father knows it. Jesus knows what it is like to be in that sort of place. To truly feel the barbarous nature of sin and its effects. And yet his love wells up and forgives even so. Perhaps it's illustrated by the well-known drama, The Long Silence, which I'll abbreviate here. At the end of time, billions of people were seated on a great plain before God's throne. Most shrank back from the brilliant light before them. But some near the front talked heatedly, not cringing with cringing shame, but with belligerence. How can God judge us? How can he know about suffering? Snapped a pert young brunette. She ripped open a sleeve to reveal a tattooed number from a concentration camp. We endured terror, beatings, torture, death. In another group, a Negro boy lowered his collar. What about this, he demanded, showing an ugly rope burn, lynched for no crime but being black. And of course there were others that came forward with their case. How lucky God was to live in heaven. What did God know of all that man had been forced to endure in this world? So each of these groups with a different complaint sent forth their leader, chosen because he had suffered the most. A Negro, a Jew, a person from Hiroshima, a horribly deformed arthritic, a formidable child. In the centre of the vast plain they consulted with each other. At last they were ready to present their case. It was rather clever. Before God would be qualified to be their judge, he must endure what they have endured. Their decision was that God should be sentenced to live on earth as a man. Let him be born a Jew. Let the legitimacy of his birth be doubted. Give him a work so difficult that even his family will think he's out of his mind. Let him be betrayed by his closest friends. Let him face false charges. Be tried by a prejudiced jury and convicted by a cowardly judge. Let him be tortured. At last let him see what it means to be terribly alone. Then let him die so there can be no doubt he died and let there be a great host of witnesses to verify it. As each leader announced his portion of the sentence, loud murmurs of approval went up from the throng of people assembled. When at last he'd finished the pronounced sentence, there was a long silence. No one uttered a word, no one moved. For suddenly, they all knew that God had already served his sentence. And that drama is written about whether it's right for God to judge people. And only in a sense because he's felt it can he judge them. But I think he can forgive people in a just way because he has actually felt that as well. He knows what it is to feel the worst possible sins and yet his love has triumphed over that. If he hadn't felt those things people could criticise him, people could perhaps say you don't know but he does know. On the cross of course we did our worst, I spoke about that last time, that we did our very worst to Jesus. So there is nothing that we can do now 
that is going to stop his love. We did our worst and yet he still loves us. So there is nothing that we can now do that will stop that love towards us. And that is so good. But the backdrop behind the worst that we were doing was the powers of darkness were also doing their worst. Their weapons of violence, betrayal, abuse and death. Yet Jesus is stronger. Hebrews put it this way. He too shared their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. The powers threw their worst at Jesus and yet he still rose from the dead. He was victorious. There is nothing that can stop him. He is unstoppable. And as we place our faith in him, all that, has, all that is won by Jesus becomes ours. He is the representative, the new humanity that has birth forth. He is the author and pioneer of our faith. Someone once described it as you're in a jungle, you can't get out. But Jesus has cut through the jungle so we can get out. And so we can now walk through that path. He is the trailblazer of a new humanity. And as we put our faith in him, his Holy Spirit becomes in us and it begins to change us from the inside out. A new humanity is birth. There's an old Jewish joke that tells the story of Judgment Day. <clears throat> At the end of history, God will summon all the people who have ever lived. Where well, here's what he's going to do, he explains. Gabriel will read out the Ten Commandments one by one. And as he does, those who have broken them will have to depart into everlasting darkness. Commandment number one is read out and a number of people are led off. The same thing happens with each of the commandments until having read eight of the ten, only a small crowd remains. God looks up to see a handful of stern, smug, grim-faced, self-righteous, joyless misery staring back at him. He pauses and contemplates the prospect of spending eternity with this lot. All right, he shouts. Everyone come back. I've changed my mind. Now, I think there are problems with that, because if you got to commandment 10, but 10, do not covet, we would all clearly failing inside. And I think that's what God is really about. He's not looking for people who can outwardly perform. He's looking for people who inwardly have been transformed from the inside out to people who truly love. And that's what he does in Christ, this new humanity. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new is here. In Colossians it says, Christ in us, the hope of glory. We have the presence of Jesus in our hearts through the Holy Spirit transforming us so that we become more like Jesus and that new humanity. God is putting the worlds to rights and he has started by doing that in you and me as we accept Jesus and as he transforms his new people he will begin to transform the whole world and the cosmos and set it to rights. I think this is picked up by one in 1 Corinthians 15 in this marvellous passage about the resurrection. Verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through one man, that is Adam, the resurrection of the dead comes through a man, Jesus. For as in Adam all die, and we were like that enslaved to the powers, so in Christ, in Christ, all will be made alive, each in their turn. Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. 
the last enemy to be destroyed is death. It's not just that we need to be forgiven or that we might be forgiven and go to heaven. It's actually about God creating a new humanity and restoring the world to its, excuse me, to its original creation. God is doing much more. He is putting the worlds to right as he transforms us. So you see, what happened is, just to recap, by sinning, humanity no longer reigned for God in his world. We lost our vocation, the thing we were meant to do. Instead, we became servant to the powers, Satan and his kingdom. But now, we have been forgiven, restored to God. We have been given his life in us so that we're supposed to do what we're supposed to do. We're once again, like Adam, we're called to subdue the earth. We're called to look after it. We're called to reign. That's what Christ is working in us. We are his co-workers in his kingdom. To join with him, who must reign until it happens. To be sure, Jesus has triumphed. It is inevitable that he is going to put the worlds to right. In one sense, the cross reveals his justice, that he is going to put the worlds to right. But it is inevitable. It will happen. And yet it is not all here and now. We see something of it because Christ is reigning. Literally, it means he is kinging. Jesus is kinging now. But he does not force himself on us and the world. He is not about coercion. He is about love. Just as Jesus came as a servant and gave his life as a ransom for many, so we must be like him, serving in our reigning. As someone has said, we are called to serve with the heart of a king and to reign with the heart of a servant. Called to serve with the heart of a king. That's the idea of a sense of royal identity. Out of that identity we serve and we reign with the presence and power of God but with a heart of serving and loving others. The cross and the resurrection do point to a day of justice. Acts 17 for example verse 30 in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So there will come a time of judgment where God will judge people. And we rejoice that Hitler, for example, will not get away with what he has done. He will face judgment and punishment. You see, God is love and he does not coerce people. If people choose not to have a relationship with him, then he will not force that on people. And ultimately he will say, well, OK, you've chosen not to have that relationship with me. Therefore, he withdraws his Zoe life, this, this, his life that he is still touching people with and withdraws it all so that people actually die the second death. And that will be the end of people. Personally, I don't believe in eternal conscious torment in terms of hell, but I do believe that people will be judged. They will be held accountable and will face punishment. But us as Christians, ahead of time, God has justified us in Jesus Christ. So how does this talk about the cross showing the justice of God affect us and our lives, and particularly in this moment of crisis? To be sure, the world is not fair. But everything in the world is not God's will. There are other wills involved. But God is bringing the world to rights. The cross says that. The cross says that he is going to do that in his time. And his new world, the abundant life, has come into the world. His kingdom has started. 
It is moving into the world. It, his creation is coming. And he calls you and I to join with him to be part of that transformation. For us individually to be tra transformed from the inside out by his power of the Holy Spirit. The incredibly great power for us who believe. He calls us to reign with him. But not over people but under circumstances. With the under people in the sense of having a heart of a servant. And I want you as we in this crisis not to think hugely about the coronavirus but instead think about the humble daffodil. The daffodil in Swiss German apparently is the oyster oyster clocker or something like that. <laughs> it means the Easter bell. And so when you see a daffodil I want you to be reminded that Jesus has won. The, the the effect of Easter is that he is going to put this world to rights. God is love. He is bursting with it. It is a love way and beyond what human love has. And if we think we have a measure of his love, we have nothing in comparison to what he still has to give. This love leads him to, be, to put the world to rights.